backwards. Okay, good morning, everyone. Bill Lester here with Hernando County Extension. Uh, welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. Today, I'm here with my regular co-host, Lily Browning. Lily is our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. And once again, it's, uh, it's our lucky Thursday because the two of us are available and free yes, and on is. here yeah. to answer your questions. So if any of you have any questions at all, comments, pictures, whatever it might be, go ahead and ask in the chat and let me put my email address up here if you want to send me any pictures. Yes, send them all to Bill. Uh, I thought I was going to make it last week, but as you mentioned, there was a last minute um, participating in this this series of things that they asked me to do, but I didn't realize the kickoff was for three hours on Thursday morning. So, Yeah, somebody says, we have a meeting Thursday morning. Oh, okay. It's for three hours. What? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Does it have to be three hours? Can't we knock it out in 15 minutes? <laughs> oh, no, no. No, no I have been uh, invited, if you want to call it that. I mean, I guess it was my choice, but sometimes when higher ups, you know, ask you to do something, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, okay, well, then I'll do it. And it's called a strategic leadership journey. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to learn growth skills you can hone your leadership skills there we go and as i was saying i um at least the way i'm looking at the screen you and i are backwards from how we normally are and i think that was because yeah see i'm on oh. the, i'm on the left you're on the right yeah yeah probably because you came on first well no you were here and then remember we were removing each other <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. You, fun. You, you went on screen first, so I guess it starts as I'm looking at it from the left and the right. And yeah. then, I don't know. So it looks like I'm in charge. So that leadership um, <sighs> one meeting, that one three hour meeting is really paying off. Yeah, it's working already. Yeah. <laughs> what we need to do is get a nice big panel discussion on here because I have done classes using this platform and we've had 10 people on the screen all at once and speaking of doing classes using this platform you and i did this kind of impromptu on tuesday because we tried to do a facebook live and it crashed and burned it was yeah i couldn't make it work and i still haven't had a chance to play with that to figure out because facebook keeps changing Right. the screens and the tabs and the rules and everything and it used to be so easy to just push a button or two and go live now it's not that easy yeah and so it was a complete and utter disaster and we deleted it as soon as it went up um and then we punted as we usually do and we said well let's just record something on this stream yard platform talk about the same thing it wasn't as fun because we weren't standing outside but i think we still got the message across and we talked for about 20 minutes on um, watering rules, you know, here in Hernando County. Mm -hmm. So check it out on either and of our that's, Facebook pages. That's on our Facebook also. I have our Facebook address there, too. And mine is the same, but it will say um, Hernan no, Hernando FFL program. You have a short name also. <laughs> yes. And... Um, Yesterday, to follow up on that, I have a you know my regular Wednesday morning hour-long Zoom class where I hone in on details about um, well caring for your landscape when it's hot and dry. But I talk a lot about uh, irrigation practices, watering things like that, and I got a very very nice compliment on um, that, which I copied and pasted and sent to you, <laughs> and. Um, just a gentleman was saying that I, I covered it more thoroughly than I ever have <laughs> before, and it really answered all of his questions. So, you know, that is it. Go back to the Facebook page if, if you want to know about what, watering rules in Hernando County, but also just the best ways to care for, you know, your lawn and your mm -hmm. landscape in general during this hot, dry time. There's nothing unusual happening right now 
it's May in Florida, <laughs> and then it is very normal for it to be hot and dry. Um, it's usually hotter by May. Yeah, I know. I can't get in my pool yet. It's not warm enough. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, how ours has been warm enough for a while. Mine is not. Um, you have a heater. You have a solar heater. Yes, but that only adds a few degrees, and we had it just set all the way up because during the winter you want to get as much heat in there as you can. And ours, we check the temperature, and it's like well into the nineties. It's like we need to turn that thermostat back no, a little no, bit. No, no, no. See, until it gets to ninety, ah, Lily's not getting in there, and <laughs> we haven't got there yet. I like eighty-eight. Eighty-eight's a good pool temperature, and a lot of people think. Yeah, it's but it's eighty-eight hot. just in that where that. Thermometer's floating, not further down. <laughs> so it'll be a little bit before I'm in there, yeah, a week or two maybe. Um, but next week we're going to keep following up um, on this theme of watering. And uh, for Dr. Lester, I'm going to host Dr. Lester uh, with getting to know your irrigation system. Because he's a little better at, you know, all the mechanics of it and everything. You know, make your face look like you're, you're an expert at that. <laughs> yeah, he's really Yeah, we got that. that next Wednesday, don't we? Yes. Okay. And the reason, why am I talking all month about, why am I harping about watering and water conservation all month? Because this is a dry month. <laughs> yes. And as I keep reminding people here at Hernando County Utilities, take a wild guess as to which month of the year we pull the most water out of the aquifer for our customers. Probably May. Probably May would be correct. So sometimes April gets pretty high up there too. Yeah. How hot it is. This past April wasn't a horribly hot April. Um, it was a dry April, but it wasn't a really hot April. Right. It was still chilly overnight and first thing in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, and as I told the class yesterday, see, you know, in our line of work, we come across many different, you know, types of people, but I have many followers of Florida Friendly Landscaping who are very much you know into protecting the environment and they are pretty much anti-lawn you know or or um you know and they want to know why why are you even promoting irrigation systems why are you promoting lawns and as bill would know i'm not i'm not promoting either of those things we both have what we call freedom lawn which means whatever grows there grows basically. And neither one you or I use an irrigation system. I don't think if I concentrate my efforts on those who do have, you know, very, very tidy, very tidy, very, you know, are very concerned about their lawns or they have to be for where they grow. If I teach them the most efficient way to do it, that is not going to encourage someone who is not interested in that to start watering more. You know, that's not going yeah. to happen. The only thing that's going to happen is we're hopefully are going to start saving water. All of us who are don't irrigate, we're not going to be you know, swayed over to the irrigation site. So we're OK. <laughs> you know, you know, what we need to do is concentrate on those who don't realize how much they're overwatering, and that's what I spend a lot of time in May trying to do. So, okay, we have a couple questions on here mm -hmm, about sweet potatoes. Yes, Janice at says that she planted sweet potatoes on April third, which is fine. Technically, that's a little early. You can plant them later. You can plant them right now. They're going to do fine over the summer, but April's fine. <clears throat> They're really taking off, but suddenly they have holes in some of the leaves. And she's going to try to send a photo, but she couldn't. <laughs> uh, if you want to email it to me, I could, you know, screen share it on here and show everybody. But I've seen that before. And while Lily was talking, I went ahead and pulled up 
So you have basic information here on growing sweet potatoes. And I'll go ahead. Do they have like little leaf, leaf hoppers or something on sweet potato leaves? Or? The main pest to sweet potatoes here, and that's a very long link that I shared, but that's a link to some UF information on sweet potatoes. We have sweet potato weevil, and it's a beetle, and it can chew holes in the leaves. And if you let them go, they can chew holes in the sweet potatoes and damage them later in the season. Because right now the sweet potatoes are small. There's a number of different things that can chew holes in sweet potato leaves. Um, it gets a few caterpillars, possibly a grasshopper, if it's only a few holes. What you need would to do is make, make holes or they would make like bite marks, wouldn't they? Holes can be made by a grasshopper. Grasshoppers chew either on the edge of the leaf or they'll chew mm -hmm. holes in the middle of the leaf, depending on the size and okay. species of the grasshopper. It's a possibility. Caterpillars are a definite possibility. Mm -hmm. um, beetles are probably the most likely possibility. So what should she do? Not a whole lot. If there's just a few holes in the leaves, um, don't worry about it. You're always going to get some leaves chewed up. If you start to get a good amount of damage, uh, we do have a class. And let me go ahead and pull up a link to that. And here's our sweet potato class. Did you do that last year? Did. When did we do that? We did that either last year or the year before. Mm -hmm. um, got a, a University of Florida expert on to teach all about growing sweet potatoes because it is a new commercial crop over on the eastern side of the state, over around St. John's County, mm -hmm. uh, Putnam County, areas like that, um, to grow in the summer and make more money. And okay. sweet potatoes do really well in Florida. If you only have a few holes in the leaves, don't worry too much. Other than that, you're going to have to scout and figure out what insect is doing the damage and then take steps from there. Sweet potatoes, okra, and black eyed peas. Black right? eyed peas, yep. You can grow they all three during the summer. Traditional um, crops that grow well in the summer. And plus, everyone's been experimenting with different tropical and African kind of crops and fruits. And like you're going to do one coming up on dragon fruit, right? Yes, we have that coming up in a little bit less than two weeks. So hopefully everybody's had a chance to visit our Facebook page and check out the information on that class and sign up. If you sign up for the class, you're going to get three plants, but you have to come pick them up from us. So if you live in the Panhandle, it's a long drive to our <laughs> office. If you live in Miami, it's a long drive to get to our office. So this is kind of more for um, local people. Local people, yeah. Mm -hmm. And most everybody who takes these classes is from Hernando County, and we do get some from Citrus. And Pasco. One or two from Sumter, and definitely some from Pasco. Mm -hmm. That should be fun. So you can't go dragging down here from, from Leon County or Dade County <laughs> or up here. You know, if you really want to, that's fine. You can sign up and pay online, but you're going to have to make that. And, you know, there's things to see and do here in Hernando County. You can come and visit for the day and yeah. swing by and pick up your plants. You could do it, but we'd like <laughs> to warn everybody in advance. That's, it would be a pretty expensive dragon fruit. Yeah, nowadays <laughs> it's going to cost you very expensive. and a hotel stay. <laughs> um. I had a question from our regular viewer, Lee, and I'm not sure if she's on here with us today or not, but she sent a picture of an Ethiopian apple. Are you, are you familiar with Ethiopian apples? No, I am not. Well, neither am I. That makes two of us. So let's see the picture that she sent.
And this is a picture of an Ethiopian apple. And I'm not familiar with that. That's a, um, that I can kind of tell is some kind of tropical fruit tree. I did look online and they, they grow apples in Ethiopia. Apparently Mennonite missionaries took apples to Ethiopia a hundred or more years ago and they do grow apples in Ethiopia. But Ethiopian apple is definitely a um, common name. Yeah. So I'm not sure because I'm not really the expert on tropical fruits what this is. But I could tell you from looking at the picture, it has some kind of fruits on it, and they are all chewed up. So I would suspect, suspect number one would be a squirrel or some kind of similar animal. And keep in mind down there, you have invasive lizards and you have all kinds of things. Here she is, Lee's here joining us. Yes. So it could be an animal. And in which case you're going to have to just watch and be observant and see, do I see an animal up there chewing on my fruit? I had a nectarine tree years ago and it would flower and I get a bunch of nectarines on it. Darn squirrels would always eat every last one. I had a couple of plum trees in my yard and they would never bother the plums. They liked the nectarines. They would eat all of them long before they were big enough and ripe enough for me to pick and eat. Um, second suspect would be some kind of beetle because beetles do chew on the skin and the outside of fruits. Third suspect would be stink bugs or something similar to stink bugs that poked holes in that fruit when it was very small. Then as the fruit gets larger, those holes are going to let in bacteria and fungi and you're going to get rotten spots on it. So is that fruit edible as is? Depends. You can pick it. You can cut off the damaged part and maybe part of it is fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, it all depends on it's open. Yeah, all because damage to it is not necessarily do, doesn't make the fruit unsafe to consume. You can carve that off, but damage that lets bacteria in and now you have bacteria going deeper into the fruit, you're gonna to have to cut off even more of it. Well she says so it's I, really bad. Um, if you buy an apple at the store and it has a bruise, you can cut that off. If it has just a cut that it got in the shopping cart when you threw it in the cart, you know, when you're when mm -hmm. you're rushing through Publix and just throwing stuff in your cart, you could trim that off. If it's something that happened weeks ago and bacteria have gotten into it, now half of it's rotten. Yeah. If you want to save half the apple, you probably could. You may not want to. <laughs> she says the fruit splits open and and then it rots. It's not an app, not an animal. She doesn't think it's an external, you know, thing happening to it. It's fruit splitting open would almost tell. I mean, with other types of fruits, isn't that like an overwatering? Yes, that's an uneven watering. So if your tree goes along with either a little bit of water or maybe regular watering or maybe a lack of watering, and then either you water the heck out of it or we get days and days of rain, the tree or plant will suck up a lot of water faster than the fruit can expand its skin and get bigger, right. and it will split. Watermelons yeah. do that. Tomatoes do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. That's really what it, 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 it. The water fills it up before its growth cells are growing <laughs> to accommodate that. So. Yeah, tomatoes are notorious for that. It can happen to peaches, plums, and nectarines also. So other types of fruits, if it all of a sudden gets way too much water for a bit, that's why it's important when a plant has fruit on it you keep it evenly watered. Not way, way, way too much. I'm not saying that you have to add ridiculous amounts of water, but you don't want it to get too dry or have it really unevenly watered. You want it to because be then when it gets a lot of water, fruits will split. Yep, you want to be consistent. Oh, that's um Corey says the same thing happens to him when he goes to an all you can eat buffet. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, Lee says this is the first year this has happened. Maybe it's too hot and dry. That could very well be. And the tree got dry and the fruit was okay. And the fruit was continuing to grow bit by bit. But then if you get, and this usually happens when we get an extended period of rain right. or a huge rain, it'll get, your, the roots will suck up too much water and the fruits will split. I found um, in, you know, the, the magic lot that we bought next door <laughs> that my husband has been hand clearing for a year now, finding all kind of goodies. I think those days are over because um, he has um, hurt himself <laughs> swinging an axe. <laughs> Wow. He has not used an axe to clear the entire lot. Let me make that clear. He has used power tools, but well, he was um, removing a little bit of palmettos. We have not removed them all. They're, they're great for wildlife, but we've been removing some of them. And he was using an axe for that for like two hours, two days in a row. And he has finding out he's not 30. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so then we paid someone to come and <laughs> finish some stuff up for us. But I found a surprise, another surprise. I keep finding surprises in there. And this one was really surprising because it's not a like a seedling. It's, it's a decent size. But you know how the turkey oaks will grow real scraggly and bent and, you know, thin trunks. Mm -hmm. So this is in with a group of those. So what am I to assume, except it's a group of turkey oaks or even sand live oaks. And, you know, when they're young, they grow together in a group. To me, it looks like they're dancing in a rave. <laughs> anyway, I assume that's what that was. And then I walked past it and I was looking at it and like, what the heck? You know, those are not oak leaves at all. So I looked up my suspicion and I got a persimmon. <laughs> growing in there a wild persimmon. we have a lot of wild persimmons in here i just very have not realized because i've only seen them tiny i guess hadn't paid attention to them adult size that you cannot tell their trunk from a an oak trunk it's just that the leaves are absolutely yeah the leaves are different yeah so they're bigger and softer and you know all that stuff so was like, told him, okay, leave this one alone. We've got some a wild persimmon. I said, I don't think it's anything we're ever going to get fruit for. But, you know, if it puts out some fruit, the wildlife will get it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's mostly for wildlife. It's really tough to get wild persimmons ripe enough where they're actually enjoyable eating. But Corey said he got a tractor because doing that kind of stuff by hand is really, really hard work. <laughs> yes. And, you know, Father's Day is coming up. Good gift oh. idea. He has well, like one of those massive um, uh, weed eaters that, you know, like you push a DR mower kind of. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's got a chipper. He's got a, um, I mean, it's a riding mower. <laughs> so chipper just, for some reason he decided to play lumberjack <laughs> those two days. Well, Corey also. hopefully he's making a lot of mulch and a lot of compost for you with yeah, all that. Yeah, he is. Mm -hmm. oh. um, Corey has a good point. I think he's talking about my persimmons, that out of 100, I think 99 of them are male. So I may not get any fruit. So oh. thank you for pointing that out, but I'll still leave the tree there. So. And here's a question for you from Monique. Do you have to deadhead Budleas? And that's butterfly plants. Um, I don't think the ones that don't do really great here. They they do great further north of here. Here they're yeah. a little sketchy. If you want to, I'm sure it won't hurt. You know, and it will encourage blooming. Anytime you deadhead, you know, anything, it's going to encourage more blooming. Mm -hmm. But if you go away and skip it, and you know, I don't think anything terrible is going to happen. Yeah, yeah, it will probably encourage more blooming, but if you don't do it, that's okay also. You know, crepe myrtles and just about anything that flowers out there, it helps if you cut the spent blooms off. Sure, yeah, or roses, obviously, and, you know, um, even your wildflowers. But the, I mean, wildflowers, I would leave those 
to go to seed. So yeah, to help spread more of them. It's sure, important. some of them like salvias and dune sunflowers and gallardias. If you start with one and it starts flowering, every flower makes a whole bunch of seeds and you'll have huge numbers of little tiny plants all coming up. Yep. yep. And again, yeah, Corey's making clear he's talking about the persimmon that, you know, most of them are male. That is something I recently learned within the last year or so about our native grapevine as well. Yeah. I just figured I never saw grapes because the animals got them first. But I think it was Frank Gaudo who was had my job in Pasco who said no, most of them, most of the vines that you see are male. So just interesting um, dynamics out there. We have found a little baby magnolia, which is not shocking, but it was kind of fun to find that. And the person we paid, they removed a very, very, very large dead tree. So um, when the rainy season starts, we're going to move baby magnolia in the place of where that <laughs> dead tree was. One of the most exciting finds for me because of where it's located. My sister has them all over the place. Um, a red maple seedling. Mm -hmm. Now where my sister lives is, I mean, very, her lawn is her yard is always squishy. <laughs> you know, she's in, she's more in um, Brooksville. Remember, we went to that one house that had the creek in the backyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was all hardwood hammock there. That's yeah, very, she's very in that neighborhood. And so I went to her house the other day and saw she's got baby red maples all over the place. But I was excited because I'm, you know, in a uh, sand hill type <laughs> area. So we'll see how well mm -hmm. it does. I've marked it so it does not get, um, you know, cut down if someone's back heals and <laughs> they get over exuberant. So it's been fun finding, you know, the things that are out there. And a perfectly beautiful growing palm that is not native by any <laughs> means. It is one of those like parlor palms that up north would be a you know house plant or that you can find you know in any big box store and stuff mm -hmm. why is it there i don't know other than years ago landscapers probably just threw their extra stuff in those empty lots yeah a lot of those the seeds slash berries that palms get are viable and will grow i have a queen palm and if i don't cut off the flower heads and the seeds mm -hmm in time yeah. they'll fall off and a lot of them do pop up well yeah where uh lee and um cindy and them are it the further south you get there they're looking at queen palms as being uh, potential invasive yeah so, so. and yeah. it looks like we have um people asking questions and other people answering them for us so great. so yeah so let's go just get some coffee bill <laughs> Monique asked, when are the seeds ready from Gaiardia? And Corey answered pretty much the exact same thing I would have said. Um, he's not sure how early you can harvest, but for best germination, wait for them to dry on the plant. So the flower is going to dry. The petals are going to drop off. You're going to actually see the little seeds on the flower head. And then you can cut them off. I store them in a paper bag because if there's any moisture, paper breathes. Right. If you throw things in a baggie and there's any moisture, things will get furry and nasty. Sure. You so. don't have to put them in a refrigerator. Corey will be here all day, so, you know, we're done, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll just leave and go to work. We'll just leave the room open. <laughs> I wonder if that would work. Well, I need my laptop <laughs> to come to, to do my work, so, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, this is on my office computer. Yeah. I wonder I if we have my laptop. It goes wherever I go. So. There is a time limit for Facebook Live, so eventually they, they chop us off. Yeah. But we could anyway, just leave the room open and leave. You don't need to put Gallardia seeds in the refrigerator or anything. They grow very well here in Florida. They don't need mm -hmm. to be um, scarified, you know, stratified. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, I, I just let them go. I just let them do their thing naturally. But you can collect them as well. 
Yeah, and you can plant them right away. You can store them in a paper bag and then plant them next spring if you want to. You can grow them in little pots, little containers to start a bunch. If you just have an empty area out in your yard, you want to just throw a bunch of seed out there, you can do that. And Galardia, poor Galardia. I, I have to warn people all the time. Poor Galardia is, was kicked off the team. Isn't that sad? Oh, no. He's kicked off the native plant team. <laughs> and there's Teresa working hard in the background, telling us about See, Galardia. Teresa is, is tuning in today. For those who don't know what Gallardia is, we're talking about blanket flower, that beautiful orange flower. And as um, well, there is a native variety out there, but the the prolific ones with the big, beautiful orange heads and everything, it has been determined and decided. What what makes a native plant? So they had to draw a line somewhere, and they decided it was here when. Europeans came over. So when old Wani came over here, <laughs> do you know what plants were here? 1530, I think, is the timeline. Yeah. We're going to call that native. Well, I guess they did research and carbon dating or whatever and said those blanket flower were not here then. Therefore, they got kicked off <laughs> the native plant team gorgeous gorgeous flower i would encourage its use you know as much as you can and butterflies love it and it lasts uh, you know really till freeze starts coming up pretty early in the spring and will last until well till it starts getting dark earlier really you know so they are still florida friendly absolutely yes and I, I say the poor things have been Plutoized. <laughs> Pluto is no longer a planet. Yeah. <laughs> Glardia is no longer a native plant. So, oh, a local ecotype of Coreopsis. There's so many different types. I, I'm i not sure. There is. There's a lot of different. I'm not sure the eleven worthy are, you know, originated, you know, like in Hernando County or anything. Yeah, there are many different types of, uh, of Coreopsis or tick seed. And those you can tell, you know, the ruffles on the flowers and stuff are a little bit different, but I don't really know one from the other. Tick seed is tick seed and makes me happy. Tick seed I can get to grow in pots just as well as in the ground, too. So, yeah, we have a couple different types growing in our native garden right out front here at our office. Ooh, polka dot. And Mithril says, I have a couple varieties of polka dot plants in my shady pollinator garden. They are pink and green, really pretty. Now they're spreading, and I'm tempted to let them go and replace a small patch of lawn that's left on that side of the driveway. Can you think of benefits or drawbacks to letting them do their thing? Is that like some kind of caladium? Is that what she's referring to? Polka <laughs> dot plant is... And I've seen them at the stores. It's not native. Right. It is a, a, a lot of times used as a house plant uh -huh. that has polka dot leaves. Really, a very, very pretty plant. I've, right. I've had it before. I've seen it too, but it, it's, the leaves are kind of caladium y looking to me. Mm -hmm. um, I would just do some research, make sure that it's not showing any invasive tendencies. And then, you know, if it's not, then otherwise, if you, um, you know, you, it's hard to get things to grow in the shade. <clears throat> so if that's working for you and it's not, you know, oh, there's Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Teresa's thrown more links in here. So yeah, this is where you can find out. Yeah, I guess is, is the, that Latin name there. Mm -hmm. I post days. And um, that's an assessment of it from UF. So they'll tell you if it um, is known to be invasive or not by going to that site. And if it says no, you know, or if it's not showing any potential, go ahead, let it fill in that spot for you. You know, why not? You know. 
Yeah, because if you have turf grass growing in a very shady area, it's never going to do really well. It's not necessarily going to completely die and disappear, but it's never going to thrive and do really well. Right. So if you're trying to grow um, either Bahia or St. Augustine underneath a very thick tree, uh, a lot of dense shade, it's always going to be thin. Whether it's a little thin or a lot thin depends on how shady it is. And the polka dot plant will provide, you know, homes for lizards and other fun critters like that, you know, much more mm -hmm. than scraggly turf would. <laughs> so, and probably look very nice. But again, check because any plant, you know, can go bad at any time <laughs> in our greenhouse that we live in. So you don't want to be cursing us five years from now. Bill and Lily said I could do this and now yeah eating my neighborhood <laughs> so. well, with part of that university of florida assessment they have to reassess every plant every i think it's four years mm -hmm. because things change so we may have get a plant here in florida that's grown very very little they put it through an assessment and they go ah it's okay but if more and more people start growing it it starts getting loose out in natural areas the, the assessment and the designation for them change. They're always updating. So it's impossible for me to keep on top of everything. It is. Potentially yeah, and, invasive. And with climate change and we're getting warmer, you know, some things that didn't used to be invasive this far up here, you know, are becoming so. And, and there are yeah. plants like Melaleuca. It's very invasive in South Florida not very invasive in central Florida and not at all in North Florida because it will not take the cold. Right. And it will die. If, it, if you try growing it in your yard up there in the panhandle, it will freeze and die in the winter. So because of that, it's not going to get loose and spread wildly. So it comes down to where in Florida you live also. This is a very, very long state. The Melaleuca tree, um, its common name is the punk tree. And how it got out of control was another human intervention thing. It's a Australian tree where, oddly enough, I think it's endangered there. So I don't understand why we just don't mail them some because we. <laughs> yeah, we right here. <laughs> yes, um, and that's where Melaleuca oil comes from. So it does have, you know, all plants have some kind of benefit. Mm -hmm. We're not saying invasive plants, you know, sprang up from hell and have, you know, only evil on their minds. It is humans who move things around and, you know, mess things up. So um, it has those benefits of the Melaleuca oil, but it they planted it probably like in the 20s when they wanted to have more agriculture down in that wonderful muck soil down there in South Florida. So they planted it to help dry up the Everglades. Boy, did it um, perform well <laughs> doing that at which it was tasked to do. And now it's an invasive tree down there. So we can help counter that by purchasing Melaleuca mulch. Mm -hmm. um, Makes treated, good mulch. Treated in a bag in a store. I've heard people from South Florida telling me they were trying they went to an event where they were just giving away shredded mulch, you know, green. And now those people had melaleuca trees they didn't have before. So, yeah, it's called eco mulch or something like that. Yeah. Flora mulch. Yeah. Flora mulch. That's what it is. And it'll age to a nice silvery color. So, yeah, that's the thing with invasive plants. And we need to, you know, have some classes on them again. But no one ever said they weren't pretty. No one ever said they don't attract some wildlife. And no one ever said, you know, that they don't have some benefits somewhere out there. Their issue is they were brought here and they don't play well with others. <laughs> They're not Florida friendly because they, they don't have any natural checks and balances, balances and they can outcompete you know, our native or naturalized or Florida friendly plants. Yes. And sometimes our native plants probably do become invasive in other countries. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And like Monique points out, camphor trees, very, Definitely. very popular shade tree. They grow very quickly. They're very twiggy and very messy. So they're not, and I, if you don't mind cleaning up a lot of mess and twigs and branches all year long, but she's we have a lot of camphor trees saying, around. Yeah. They're very invasive though. They have benefits. The, the camphor, you know, is has a lots of medicinal benefits. That's what she's referring to. But, and yeah, that's, they came to be because people wanted to brag about how rich they were. So they would get these camphor trees at the Chinsegat Conservation Center. There's an old dead trunk of one that was put in front of where a house no longer stands, the conservation center, not at the manor house. And, you know, it was a, you know, showpiece because they had to get it from China and they had someone had to go down to the port of Tampa and bring it up here and plant it. So it was a huge expense and a huge look how rich I am kind of thing. And then look what happened. You know, went out of control here. Yeah, and there's pluses and minuses really to any tree. Corey says he hates camphers. It's really invasive in Central Florida. That's true. Monique has a huge hole one in her front yard. And, and that's when it's hard to get rid of. For one, it's an expense. For another, you think, oh, this lovely tree you know, gives me all the shade. But they are weak, as Bill was pointing out. They, they shed a lot. You know when you mow, you're mowing over thousands of baby camphor trees. You know mm -hmm. it. And a lot of times when they end up being taken down, they found out they're hollow inside. So it could also be a... Um, hazard you know to to your home so and something i've noticed like, especially the large older ones have a lot of competing uh, main leaders so with a with a tree yeah. you want to train the tree so that it has one main trunk and then branches coming off of it with camphers if you and everyone i drive by and a large older one maybe waist high it branches off into as many as 10 Mm -hmm. major trunks and during a storm two trunks can have really weak wood between them they can go snap and it splits down the middle and now comes one one comes down your house the other one on your neighbor's car sure so they're Fast not growing always means weak and people do love them because they have that kind of oak look to them when they get you know big Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, what I've heard more than once is, I, you know, I moved to Florida. I don't have 40 years to wait yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. You know, well, what's tree a tree fast tree? growing shade tree? Well, they all take more than a month. Right. <laughs> but campers yeah. are fast growing and they do give a lot of shade. But they are a very, I don't think um, you're even allowed to buy them. Nurseries aren't allowed to sell them. I don't think. Think they might I've be never seen them for sales at a nursery. Yeah. I don't think, you know, there are very, very few plants where there's actually laws against selling them. But I think those are one of them. I'm not sure that it could be. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's still plenty of them around. And as Monique said, yes, she does find all the little seedlings. That's what's right at you. What about the birds eating the barrel berries and going a few miles away and replanting them. Yep. That, that happens too, all the time. So yeah, there was one, um, our friend the arborist took one down at uh, our dentist. <laughs> I think before you started going there, as you pull in, um, there was yeah, a yeah, yeah. huge tree there and that was a camper <clears throat> tree in downtown Brooksville. He said it was absolutely hollow inside there. Yeah, and you don't know until you either cut it down or it blows over in a storm. Mm -hmm. And you really don't want that to happen. So right. and they got it so cut down before that. It's still odd to me to drive in there and not negotiate around the tree because I'm used to it being there. Yeah. But it needed to come down. So. Yeah, that's why you want to work with a board certified arborist to check your tree to make sure it's safe. They have ways of determining as best they can whether it's hollow inside or not. I read an article recently, and I think there's new technology. I'm not really sure what, 
like a type of radar or something like that that gives them a better idea of how solid a tree is in the center, whether it has mm -hmm. big dead spots or open spots or rot or it's all healthy wood. Um, Maybe don't or... ask, don't yeah. ask us to make safety recommendations for a tree because we can't do that. Nope. You have to deal with a, a certified arborist for them to physically come out, look at it, and then give their evaluation in writing. And Corey says he hiked 30 minutes into the Ocala National Forest and found camper all over. Sure, you know, Big they problem get, in the woods. get them from in Ocala or, you know, um, Anthony or somewhere around there and fly into the forest. Um, McKeith and Park, they're out there in the woods. Sure. Um, you know what I found in the Ocala National Forest, which I found surprising? Um, and it was around Juniper Springs. I wasn't hiking far deep into the woods like Corey, but I was at Juniper Springs. Mm -hmm. Citrus all over the place. Wild growing citrus. That is usually left over from citrus that was grown there a hundred years ago. Yes. Yep. And it will, it, it, I mean, it can spread from seed. Sure. It's going to be wild citrus, not the whatever improved variety they were growing and harvesting. Way exactly. Back it's gonna, if, if it, you know, mixed fruit, it would be sour oranges. Mm -hmm. But there was, it looked pretty invasive there. And you can make. Um, oh, yeah, the old. The citrus and... mojo marinade with the sour oranges. I need to. Uh... They, made, they made marmalade. They made like a lemonade. Yep. Yeah. I think sour oranges are one of the best ones to use for orange marmalade. And it mm -hmm. seems strange because you pick the most sour orange and you throw in a whole bunch of sugar. You had and anything. You end up with yummy orange marmalade. Well, go right. figure. Sugar changes everything. <laughs> sugar fixes everything. Yep. <laughs> they say that beauty berry is really good if you add five mm -hmm. pounds of sugar to it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, native plums. Add enough sugar, and they're going to come out really good. You can, you can preserve them. Yeah, the Chickasaw plums. I learned something new about Chickasaw plums I hadn't realized either, just because I overheard someone talking about it. I didn't realize they were thorny, the Chickasaw plums. That they can form thickets, but they're, they're thorny. Maybe the ones that you give out are more, um, have been hybridized with something else to get rid of the thorns? No, because ours, we've given out native Chickasaw plums and hog plums. And they're either very, very, very closely related species, or some people say they are the same. So it's one of right, those, right. there's a debate mm -hmm. about whether it's different species or the same. I think maybe they get thorny when they get larger and older. They're cousins or siblings or something, yes. Oh, Teresa's taking care of um, mithril for us with the polka dot plant. <laughs> and Corey has super sour oranges from a compost pile, more sour than any lemon. I may try to hit you up for some this fall or winter whenever they um, get ripe. Because I lived in a house with a sour orange tree, and I thought that there really wasn't anything you could do with it. Oh, yeah, sure. The uh, Like I said, the native Floridians, they... They knew all kind of stuff to do with it. You know, life gives you sour oranges. <laughs> you yeah, make, yeah. You make sour orange aid, I guess. And Teresa's doing a great job with the links on here. Mm -hmm. um, Corey says he uses it on pork. I know you can use it in, as um, a Cuban marinade, basically. Mm -hmm which I'm going to have to try making sometime. So let's, I only see one more kind of sort of question or comment here. So Mithriel says she had to cut down a gorgeous turkey oak last year, but she had them leave five feet in the trunk, and she's planting jasmine and butterfly pea on it this weekend. It's in the middle of her front yard. There you go. That could come out looking very, very nice. Mm -hmm. I know people will leave stumps of trees. You could put a potted plant on top of it. 
If it was hollow when they cut it down, you can clean that out and use the stump basically as a pot. Sure. And it'll do it just load down. compost for you. Yeah. Watch out for carpenter ants, though. Because mm -hmm. carpenter ants really, really like dead tree trunks. It's yep. nothing to go into a panic over. Carpenter ants are a natural part of the environment. You cannot sanitize the great outdoors. Mm -hmm. So. I think question? that's all I had. I thought oh, I had another. I had a question. We, I'll throw that question at you that I had asked. Um, someone came in here and was asking me about longevity spinach. And she has some because she believes in its health benefits by consuming it, which we can't comment on that one way or another. But she's, she's even potting um, some up for her doctor <laughs> who wants to try it out as well. Um, she's concerned about some leaf browning on the tips. So I don't know anything about this longevity spinach. So what do you have to say about that? There are some different minor vegetables, longevity spinach, there's Okinawa spinach, there's another one or two that are not botanically true spinach. It's not the same species as the spinach that we buy and eat as spinach. Um, there are plants that you can grow and you can pick the leaves and you can eat them. I've been told it's an acquired taste. So you probably want to try some before you plant your entire vegetable garden in them because you may hate it. Other people like it. And about all I know about it is, I can't remember if it was Okinawa spinach or longevity spinach. It's fine if you eat it raw. If you cook it, it turns really slimy. And that might be kind of an acquired taste. You know, it's one of those things like okra. Right. Some people, I love okra. Other people hate okra. Brussels sprouts. Blech. I like Brussels sprouts with lots of cheese on them. No, 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 no. See, I'll eat okra. I'm not going <laughs> to eat uh, Brussels sprouts. Cheese is kind of a little bit like sugar. It fixes most everything. <laughs> it most everything, but I'm sorry. I can't do Brussels sprouts. They taste like little balls of Lysol to me. <laughs> yes, here, here we're giving cooking and dietary advice. <laughs> okay. And Mithriel is a marine biologist, and she prefers to let the ecosystem do its thing. Thanks for the tip on carpenter ants. As long as they stay in the trunk, then they're welcome to it. Yeah, carpenter ants do like um, decaying wood. You okay. can get them underneath a brick or a stone or border edging around a garden underneath a pot. Mm -hmm. Living underneath potted plants is a really good way to have them surprise you or find them. Well, they just live out in the open in my yard. They don't even try to hide in anything. <laughs> they're, just, they're just like, yeah, yeah. It. And they're, they're not a huge danger either. Sure, if you catch a carpenter ant and start poking at it, it probably would bite you. But they're not like fire ants. So okay. it's, I've never gone into a panic over them. So back to the okra, do you know the difference between okra and snot? <laughs> okra has little seeds. Uh, I'm not sure eat, I want to try okra. <laughs> <laughs> and Mithriel has been here to our office to talk to the master gardeners um, using butterfly peas. So let's go ahead. And there is Lily's email. If you want to contact our office, there is our phone number. If you call here, it'll probably be Teresa who answers the phone. She was the one putting all the links up. Because she does chat. everything, yes. We could, I couldn't get through the day without Teresa. So it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, um, in case Carol is watching, I can't see all the names on here, um, but in case Carol is watching, your phone hates me. The email that we have uh, on file hates me. So your answer is <laughs> we do not have 
compost bins available at this time. And I have put you, Carol, on a waiting list to be notified when um, we get in another shipment. I'll just leave it there. The compost bins are not mine to order. They're uh, from solid waste. So um, we think Carmen's having a little bit of issues. So probably it'd be at least July, you know, before we have another shipment in. So. So just be patient. Keep following us on Facebook. As soon as they come in, we'll put together more classes. And if you are a Hernando County resident, you're more than welcome to sign up and get your free compost bin. If, if you've never gotten one from us before, yes. <laughs> one per yes, house. you're only allowed one. Is that one per household or per person? or well, household. Per household, okay. Yes. No. Because they're free. <laughs> so Can't be free. Yes. And they're not and cheap. The rain barrels, I'm, I'm, still doing, I'm doing rain barrel classes. Um, even without the compost bins, it's usually people who have been attending the rain barrel classes, they get automatically on the waiting list now for the compost bin. So you and Carmen have a big class coming up because that when those compost bins come in because I've got a pretty big list uh, going. So the rain barrel, up demand. The yes, the rain barrels are sixty four dollars. That's our cost for them. As of July 1st, they will be going up again to 65. They actually went up a little bit more and we are subsidizing, you know, the rest of the cost. Um, and, oh, also another rule as of, there's two new rules as of July 1st as well. As of July 1st, we can only give rain barrels to Hernando County residents, like the compost bins, and only you can only purchase four barrels per household. <laughs> so those will be taking place in July. So, yeah. Hey, and Lee's going to bring us some okra. Did you, I, I, I plant the seeds. I'm trying to grow okra this, this summer. Oh, it's August. I thought she was coming in September. Did you ever answer her? No, I haven't had a yeah. chance to. I have to look back at that. My September is full except for the very beginning and the very end i thought you were going to be at epaf when she was going to be here we'll have oh to yeah i am going to be there at epaf at the end of august so it's it's a complicated time of year for sure yeah yes extension professionals what association foundation association <laughs> of, of, florida. Florida. of florida okay association of florida uh -huh. it's something he has to go to he doesn't have a choice <laughs> Unless I can figure out how to get out of it. <laughs> End of August. Okay, well, Lee, I might be able to catch up with you. I don't know if Bill will be able to. So. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Oh, my goodness. We're right it's on just time. about that time. Yes. We showed some pretty good time management skills today, I think. Yes, it was all planned. Well, under your leadership, we're staying better on track, I think. <laughs> yes. you got to put me first all the time. Okay. Well, hey, thanks so much, everybody. We will be back again next Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Um, I think so. Let's check our schedule. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh and good. next Wednesday um, at 10 will be um, our class, but Bill will be doing most of the talking on getting to know your irrigation system. And what is that date? Um, the 25th or something like that? 25th, so the, yes, 25th. So the 26th. Yeah, I should be here as far as I know. Yeah, so. I'll be here. Not making any promises, but <laughs> I will try very hard to be here. Oh. Now, we'll plan on being back next week to answer your questions. If you want to email me any pictures or anything in advance, I'll go ahead and save them and we'll cover them with everybody so that we all learn from it. And until then, guys, we'll see you again next week. Take care. All righty. See you.